Uh, thank you for joining me today. Um, during today's Lunch and Learn talk, scholar Ted Dyer will look under the literary surface at um, uh, The Battler, the second of three thematically linked Nick Adams short stories by Ernest Hemingway. Uh, and as I mentioned before, next week he will look at um, the big two-hearted river. I'd like to give a big shout out for the Idaho Humanities Council. Um, they sponsored um, Ted's three talks. We're honoring them there. Uh, the Idaho Humanities Council is a nonprofit organization that serves the state that serves as the state-based partner of the National Endowment of Humanities. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Ted Dyer. Ted is a scholar who received his MA in English from Washington State University and taught 20 years as a composition instructor for the College of Southern Idaho Extension Office in Blaine County. For several years, he taught literature and jazz history for the Idaho State University Department of Continuing Education. He also worked for decades as a speaker, or he has and continues to work for decades as a speaker for the Idaho Humanities Speakers Bureau and is a recognized speaker on the life and works of Ernest Hemingway. It is my pleasure to welcome Ted Dyer. Please join me in that welcome. All right, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks for showing up. And thanks once again to the fine folks at the Idaho Humanities Council. I wanted to, uh, I'm going to actually play a video in a second uh, by way of introduction to the story. This is the second story in our series, uh, the Nick Adams stories. Now, we, I would like to, it'd be great fun to do all the Nick Adams stories, and it'd be, I, there's so much in here, it's, we're only really kind of touching the surface. But the battler is, is, a, is Nick Adams as an adolescent. We saw him as a very young boy in Indian camp. But this story has a lot of similarities to Indian camp because it, it has, you know, it has sort, it's also an initiation story. These stories are all initiating Nick into the adult world of experience. And these stories are fairly dark, they're purgatorial. You remember the whole atmosphere in Indian camp when Nick and his uncle and, and the Dr. Adams rode up, they, you know, they went deep into the forest, they went to the, the it was kind of dark and frightening. Well, we have a similar situation here where Nick, has just been knocked off the train, literally, by the conductor. He's riding the rails and gets punched. And he ends up on the side of the track. He has, rather than taking the rail to Mancelona, he gets to walk the rail. But he discovers in the darkness of the forest this encounter with, uh, with Ad Francis and Bugs. This story is a very kind of inverted take on Huckleberry Finn. Remember Huck and Jim? This is a weird, dark parody of it in many respects. Also, at the very start, we're introduced to the Tamarack Swamp, which figures so importantly in uh, uh, the, our concluding story, the Big Two-Hearted River. The swamp, the, the, the river bank, all that is, it, it develops into some, some symbolic richness, although Hemingway seems to be the least metaphorically the least metaphorical writer on the planet when you first encounter him. We, we, we'll talk maybe if we have time about some, about some of his prose style. But anyway, the, this one, the, the final story will be Nick in, in his, uh, after he comes back from Europe as a young man. But right here, we're, we see him in midlife. So, without further ado, I'm going to have uh, 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 Kristen here show us this video of Ad Walgast, who is the prototype of the battler. He's the biographical person who inspired Hemingway to write this. There is a certain quality to the fight photographs around the turn of the 20th century, particularly the old portraits, as we stare back at individuals who were molded by tougher times. With fights sometimes exceeding the 20 round mark, as boxers wailed away at each other with much smaller gloves, toughness had a higher currency. Adolphus Walgast was more than tough. He would remind us that in the ring, just like it is on the battlefield, there are varying degrees of bravery. Back when the lightweight limit was 133 pounds, Ad was still relatively small around five foot four and with a modest reach. 
These physical limitations found their expression in viciousness, leading to a nickname, the Michigan Wildcat. Turning professional in 1906 at the age of 18, Ad was introduced as Kid Wilgast, later changed to the abridgment of his first name. Less than three years in, and Ad was already a serious contender, having picked up some invaluable experience against the likes of the great featherweight, A. Patel. During the early 1900s, most bouts were subject to the no decision ruling, whereby, unless there was a knockout, no official winner would be declared. It was a ploy to try and separate boxing from gambling. In July of 1909, Ad bumped into the lightweight champion of the world for the first time, battling Nelson. Though while some newspapers gave him the nod, none of this would matter until they fought again, next year, for the title. February 22nd, 1910, Point Richmond, California. The Durable Dane and the Michigan Wildcat went to war in a fight that was scheduled for 45 rounds. Along with Nelson's first fight against Joe Gans, Stanley Ketchell's against Joe Thomas, and Joe Jeanette's against Sam McVeigh, this was one of the true epics under Queensbury rules. In a savage encounter, both men hacking away at each other, Wolgas was briefly floored in the 22nd before dusting himself off and continuing to wage war. In round 40, referee Eddie Smith had seen enough carnage. There was a new lightweight champion of the world. For those who had witnessed the science of Joe Gans, this wasn't exactly easy on the eye, but scraps of the fight film do remain, and in it can be seen an incredible pace that wasn't typical during this era of boxing. In a reign that lasted almost three years, Ad defended his title five times, each one by knockout. The last, however, remains one of the great controversies under Queensbury rules. In July of 1912, Ad squared off against Joe Rivers, who at just 20 years of age was full of confidence and led the early goings with superior boxing ability. Dropped in the sixth, Ad got up to turn it into more his kind of fight. But despite the fact they traded knockdowns in the 11th, in another classic fight, nobody could have predicted what was next. In the 13th, both men landed simultaneously and were dropped hard. Ad is said to have landed a left hand just over the groin, Rivers a right hand to the jaw. Amid cries of foul, referee Jack Welch may have even tried to help Ad to his feet. His official decision of KO 13, however, remained. Over in Rivers' dressing room, by one report, he is said to have produced an aluminium groin protector with a clear dent in it. In November of the same year, Ad met his match against Willie Ritchie, whose clever boxing frustrated those feral ways. The fouls were easier to see, and Wolgast was disqualified in the 16th. Prior to the Ritchie fight, Ad had issued a newspaper statement in which he claimed, win or lose, encouraged by his wife, he did intend to retire soon. That, of course, didn't come to pass. He continued to fight, frequently, against many of the men who would go on to challenge Benny Leonard. His memory and cognitive abilities wilting under each blow, Ad would continue to fight, even resuming the madness after World War I, until the plug was officially pulled in 1920. Fight promoter Jack Doyle became his legal guardian, allowing Ad to train at his house. But the only way to pacify this damaged fighter was to reassure him daily that he was training for a fight. In 1927, Ad was admitted to Stockton State Hospital. For the remainder of his life, movement would be restricted, behavior supervised, a prisoner left shadow boxing with his demons. Along with old rival battling Nelson, also suffering from illnesses relating to head trauma, Ad's final years were indeed confusing and lonely ones. In 1955, Adolphus Wolgast was no more. I'm sure the last thing he ever forgot was how to throw a punch. Though I do hope he was able to recall that brief period when fortune smiled on him when he was on top of the world.
This is great. Well, that was the that was the, the title uh, fight that made his reputation. Both Ad and Battling Nelson suspended the rules against fouls, so that both could could hit anywhere they wanted and engage in any brutal tactics they could summon. And, and Battling Nelson made the fight. He was the man who wanted, demanded it to go to 40 rounds. Now, we've elite, now a 15 round fight is illegal. That was the limit for, for most of my young life, but now it's 12. And Nelson said no one could go 40 rounds. And he made that as a condition of the fight. And of course, that was what brought him down. Anyway, if you see, if you get it, if you're ever interested in checking it out, it's on YouTube. They painstakingly reassembled the fight from film fragments that, that are just like potato chips. They've recreated the fight in a way that's completely believable. And, uh, and, and poor Ed just takes a ferocious beating for eight, 10, 12 rounds. And by the 20th, you, you, how's he, how does this man stand up? He rallies in the 20 rounds and comes back to win. But Ad never learned defense. He always depended upon getting hit to motivate him and tap his rage. And finally, as he won that fight and it was famous. There was, that was the longest title fight. They had, they went, fights in this era often went into the 20th round. The idea, of course, is not to have a decision. You fought until there was a knockout. And if there was no knockout, if it did go the distance, it was known as a newspaperman's decision. Newspapermen would sort of like unofficially decide who won the fight. There were, these, this was, uh, uh, yet in, interestingly enough, we've reconstituted this in cage fighting. We've recreated some of this kind of brutality. We've done this for the purposes of television. These are ground and pound events in which you could, of course, kick your opponent as well as punch them. And they're designed to get over fast. They're designed for knockouts. Anyway, that's a digression. But anyway, this, this is the person, Hemingway was a big boxing fan all the, his life. He learned to box himself. He was a student of many sports and followed many sports closely. But this person uh, was a part of his psyche. This man would rather die than stop fighting. So my first question, my introductory question, is to all of you, and thanks again for showing up, what is it that the battler battles? Anybody have any ideas? Why not take the money and run? Why not learn defense? Archie Moore, who fought into his 40s, he said, you know, you can get punched when you're in your 20s, but there's no way you're going to last in this sport. Archie Moore was a master of defensive tactics. You know, rolling with the punches. He had all kinds of cool stuff that he did. Uh, but anyway, Ad wasn't interested. So what is the battler battle? Why did this guy behave like this? Anybody have any ideas? That's a question I think that Hemingway uh, asked. So in this world of the initiation, and, and Hemingway has, uh, especially in the er these early stories, kind of a dark world view. And some people criticize him for his excessive darkness. But even in these early Nick Adams stories, before Nick can get to adulthood, He's confronting a dark world. Yes? That's okay. But Me too. That's point. She says, I'm not me unless I'm fighting. There's no question about it, is that like his biographical component, Ad Francis is very much a person whose rage is something to the point that he depends on the release of protracted combat to maintain his emotional equilibrium. This is someone who simply cannot come to terms with the world as it is. He has to fight. He fights all the time. And there's traces of this in a lot of other Hemingway stories. There's that, uh, the famous story about the bullfighter Manuel who refuses to retire and someone who is desperate to keep his career going no matter what is someone who's very much like Ad Francis in this story. 
But there's also the issue of pathological violence and the, the kind of personality that is criminal that loves violence for its own sake. So Nick is encountering someone like this in his early teens. How do we deal with people like this? We all know, in, in whatever our endeavor, we have to come to terms with difficult people. Now, if you're, if you're t teaching school and you're driving a school bus or teaching preschool, you'll, you'll encounter difficult little children. Although they're not violent usually, but they sure can be. How do we, de how do we deal with this? Well, this story, in a way, is, is, it tries to address that question in the same way Indian camp had to come to terms with the terrible aspects of the birthing process. You know, for, for millennia, human beings have had to live in a world in which infant mortality hovered around 50%. In the Elizabethan era, you know, it was about 40. You know, if, if the kid got born, it was pretty hard to get him to adulthood. So that was the aspect of Indian camp. In other words, it's violence in, and then at the end, in terms of death, it's violent to get out. You have, it's not a simple matter to die. And in the interim, the, there's the question of violence and strife and internal conflict. Ad Francis is a, someone who is never even remotely comfortable in his own skin. So, <clears throat> it's an interesting thing. That's a, and it's a great question. How, oh, how does Nick deal with it? Well, not so well. Would you like to stumble on a fist fight with the former light heavy, lightweight champion of the world? I wouldn't. And he doesn't know what to do exactly. And it's Bugs who comes to his rescue. Anyway, I want to read at the start of this here. There's also, there's a lot of aspects to uh, uh, this in which the, the fate of the battler and the fate of Nick are, are somewhat entwined. Now, I, want, I, 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 I wanted to, Hemingway names his characters in a very important way. The names of characters are significant. We saw last week in Indian camp that, that uh, Nick's father was Dr. Henry Adams. Now, like I said last week, is there a more famous American name than Henry Adams? I can't think of one. There was, of course, a biographical Henry Adams, the grandson of the second president of the United States. And that naming is supposed to give a Nick's father a kind of stature as a true Victorian gentleman. In this, we have in Ad Francis, in the naming of Ad Francis, someone who's also like Nick Adams. I was struck today, I woke up today and I remembered that Hemingway, in, in his, his first famous novel, uh, The Sun Also Rises, he named the, the main character after two of the most famous lesbians in Paris. This is an aside. Uh, the first one was Natalie Barney, who lived at 20 Rue Jacob, that was the street, and then Juna Barnes, who lived at the Hotel Jacob. What's the character's name? His name is Jake Barnes. Jake Barnes. Why would Hemingway name his character after the two most famous lesbians of Paris? That's a great question. And one we don't have time to answer today. I'm just sort of tantalizing you, all of you. Maybe we can talk to Kristen. She can, you know, we'll do a series on that. But. There's Nick Adams, and what do, we, what do we come up with if we erase the final three letters of Adams? Ad. Nick Adams and Ad Francis are in some way connected. So, at the start of our story, let me read you the first paragraph. Nick stood up. He was all right. He looked, looked up the track at the lights of the caboose going out of sight around a curve. There was water on both sides of the track, then Tamarack Swamp. As we'll see next week, Tamarack Swamp figures very prominently in <coughs> uh, the, our, our, our final story, the Big Two-Hearted River. Let's just say for, the, for purposes here, the, the, the metaphoric aspects of the swamp aren't very good. Nick wakes up in a swamp. By the way, he stood up. 
how is this situation? He felt of his knee, the pants were torn and the skin was barked. And we, we read here how he, he washes his, himself in the, in the stream. That lousy crud of a brakeman, he would get him someday. He would know him again. That was a fine way to act. Come here, kid, he said. I've got, some, I got something for you. He had fallen for it. What a lousy kid thing to have done. They would never suck him in that way again. Come here, kid. I got something for you. He repeats that sentence. Then wham! And he lit on his hands and knees behind the track. Nick rubbed his eye. There was a big bump coming up. He would have a black eye, all right. It ached already. That son of a crudding brake man. He touched the bump over his eye with his fingers. Oh, well, it was only a black eye. That was all he had gotten out of it, cheap at the price. He wished he could see it. Could not see it looking in the water, though. It was dark, and he was a long way off from anywhere. He wiped his hands on his trousers and stood up, and then climbed the embankment to the rails. How is his situation here similar to Ed Francis' situation? Right. Right. She says he's knocked down, very much like what happens to a boxer after a knockdown. What about his injuries? First of all, Nick has been punched. He's been in a fight. Now, he hasn't been in like 70 fights, like Ad Francis was. It's unbelievable, by the way, the number of fights, the thousands of rounds that these professional boxers fought. They would fight two or three times a month. So Sugar Ray Robinson, these, Sugar Ray Robinson, would have, they would have 70, 80, 90 fights. How many fights could you have? Anyway, so th th Nick is just getting started. Who, is this his first fight? We don't know. But Nick has been knocked down. And like a boxer who, who's been knocked down, he has to get up and continue the fight. And it's curious, right from the get-go, Nick stood up. He was all right. And he just, he has a black eye. It's interesting, though, that he can't see it. Well, for sure, but what else can't he see? Yeah, he can't see himself, and perhaps his connection to this other person who has had a, a, many more fights and suffered a whole lot worse. And by the way, there's also, a, this is, a, a this is, we talked last week about, of course, at the very end of Indian camp, when, uh, when Nick and, and, and his father, Dr. Adams, are in the canoe, and Nick says, you know, he knows, you, you know, especially now that he's in his father's company, that he will never die. Of course, we're haunted by the fact that the biographical models for both Nick and Dr. Adams took their own life, in the same, just like the, the Indian father did in that story. So there's that kind of, there's always a penumbra around these stories. There's always kind of, kind of, right at the very edge, there's kind of a haunting quality. And there's also a sense here, this is a story written by a man who had 40 or 30 or 40 concussions, and whose his own brain damage was one of the problems that, that, that made him end his own life. So there's a price to be paid for battling the conditions of life as they're handed to you. Anyway, let's, let's move on for a second. There's a lot more that's going on. First of all, I'd like to, uh, we'll skip over because I have to watch myself very carefully. And it's 1235, I have to keep, keep on moving. There's a lot of metaphorical aspects to all this landscape stuff. We'll talk a little bit more next time about how Hemingway gets so much metaphoric mileage out of the most bare bones uh, presentation in the world. This, this prose doesn't seem to have any metaphoric, there's no images in here, there doesn't seem to be any symbols, and yet it's somehow he manages to get symbolic dimensions to his prose. And so, but I want to move on for a little bit. I want to talk about his in first encounter with the battler. Hello, Nick said. The man looked up. Where'd you get the shiner? He said. A brake man busted me. Off the through freight? Yes. That's an awful concise sentence for a guy who's been brain damaged. So you wonder about him, what he knows and what he doesn't know. I saw the bastard, the man said. He went through here about an hour and a half ago. He was walking along the top of the cars. 
slapping his arms and singing. Do you think that's true? I'll bust him. Get him with a rock sometime when he's going through, the man advised. That's exactly the kind of ta tactics we saw from Ad Wolgast. I'll get him. You're a tough one, aren't you? No, Nick answered. All you kids are tough. You got to be tough, Nick said. That's what I said. So what's going on here? What's, what's, what's this guy, you know, at the firelight? It's almost like it's the Dante's Inferno or something. You're lost in the woods. You're walking, you know, half beat up. You have to walk God knows how many miles to the nearest town. And you encountered this guy. It would seem to me that, that right from the get-go, the battler is trying to goad Nick Adams. Yeah, I saw him. He was laughing and singing. Now, I, I rather doubt that's true, but it suggests a level of paranoia and a level of, of pathological aggression that's present right from the start. The man looked at Nick and smiled. These guys, when they smile in this story, it should you know, get the hair up on your neck. Why are they smiling? And Bud smiles too. What does a smile mean in this story? These are sinister smiles. These are not, this is, these aren't friendly people welcoming you. <laughs> Pardon? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And of course we see how, how he was misshapen. And of course, the, the famous cauliflower ears of boxers of that era. You know, if you got, if you took, you know, your, your, your ear would be sometimes torn away and it would, but it would lump up and it would turn into, into a cauliflower shape. And that was one of the hallmarks of a former fighter besides the broken nose. You know, you get so many blows to the nose and, and the actual bone would actually, you saw that picture of the ad where the, 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 his nose would be impressed into his face, it would change the shape and character of, and you see that a lot in former fighters. Um, Doug DeWitt, by the way, who was a famous boxer in the 1980s, as an old man, looked like that. I was a fight fan growing up, like Hemingway. His nose was sunken, his eyes were slits, and he had queer-shaped lips. Nick did not perceive all this all at once. He only saw the man's face was queerly formed and mutilated. It was like putty in color, dead-looking in the firelight. Don't you like my pan? the man asked. Nick was embarrassed. Sure, he said. Look here, the man took off his cap. He, only had, he had only one ear. It was thickened and tight against the side of his head. Where the other ear should have been, there was a stump. Ever see one like that? No, said Nick. It made him a little sick. This is not unlike young Nick watching his father perform the cesarean section. I could take it, the man said. Don't you think I could take it, kid? You bet. They all bust their hands on me, the little man said. They couldn't hurt me. He looked at Nick. Sit down, he said. Want to eat? Don't bother, Nick said. <laughs> I'm going on, to the next going on to the town. Listen, the man said. Call me Ad. Sure. Listen, the little man said. I'm not quite right. What's the matter? I'm crazy. Now, there's this whole business about him with asking Nick to take his pulse. This actually consumes a fair amount of the story. What's, uh, what's going on? Why is, we, did we spend so much time in this story, why is Ad making Nick take his pulse? And what's the point of having a low pulse? Yeah, it stays steady, he claims. Maybe this is a weird kind of thing. I've often been puzzled about this, and I'm, I'm, I haven't come to a real conclusion, but somehow, in some way, uh, Ad prizes himself and his extraordinary stamina. And to go 14 rounds, yeah, you need lots of stamina. So somehow, in some way, he's taking a max, masochistic pride in his ability to take it. Why, why would you do that? I mean, there, you remember, you remember the, that the Indian father took his own life. There's very definitely a kind of death wish to this man's pathological aggression. I mean, when you're old and beat up 
you're still picking fights. Why, in your old age, are you goading young men to punch you? So, needless to say, this is pretty sinister, and we haven't even gotten to add. And, of course, th this is the, more, the controversial aspect of this story. Bugs, of course, is a black man, and Hemingway uses the words Negro and, and the N-word. And, of course, this is verboten in our time. And, and this is one of the, the aspects of the story that gets Hemingway in trouble. Hemingway, by the way, it's in an odd sort of way, it, 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 it was confronting speech codes in his own time and was, it had to confront political interference with fiction that came from, from, the, from the communist movement in the 1930s in response to the Depression. So in an odd way, this kind of discussion was, uh, was pertinent in, in Hemingway's own day. But how do you, all of you feel the use of the word Negro and nigger? Are that, what's your response to that? Do you want to like ban this story from the curriculum? Is this acceptable in some way? And if so, how? And what are these, how do these words function? Yes. Well, exactly, that was gonna be my point. And, and you swiped, she said it's like Mark Twain, and, and that was exactly the point of mine. I was gonna present that as an insight. But now it's been blasted out of the water. So you get credit for the insight. You're right, it's exactly like Mark Twain. And, I, and by the way, Hemingway admired extra Twain extravagantly. He said all American fiction grew out of Huckleberry Finn. And like, as I said earlier, this is kind of a parody, an awful dark parody of Huck and Jim on the raft. Except this is Ad and Bugs at the campfire. And yes, like Twain, Hemingway uses the N-word. Now, in the 20s especially, the word Negro was not a problem. It was accepted within the black community itself. The terms Negro and colored were considered acceptable terms for public discourse. I always remember, you know, it was called the Negro Leagues, the baseball that flourished in the 1920s, and there was a, there was a whole division. It was called the Eastern Colored League in which it was, there was, uh, there was the, the Negro Leagues in the Midwest and the Eastern, uh, Eastern Negro, the Eastern Colored League on the East Coast, and they would play for a kind of Black World Series. So these were acceptable terms. Now the N-word, uh, we're getting into a little, some stranger ground here. So what's the point of using these words? Is there some, in some way, there, let, me, uh, let me just, uh, lead you a little bit. I'm, because I'm running out of time, we'll do what the, what the lawyers call leading the witness. This is a little bit of, uh, there's a sense of his otherness. Bugs, you just don't expect to see black people camping in the Michigan forest in the 1940s. In fact, you never think of black people camping at all. I never, did black people camp? I mean, th that's one of the aspects of the black experience. It's, it seems to be intensely, you're urban. This is another shock. The otherness of bugs would be experienced by Nick as a total surprise. And what is this man doing with Ad, with Ad Francis? At least it explains how Ad gets along. Ad is just not capable of caring for himself. Like his biographical counterpart who was institutionalized, Ad, not only could he not cope with the world as a young man, can now in his old age, can he not even function without full-time assistance. So tell me about Bugs. Who is, who is Bugs? What's he doing with Ad? And what do we make of his excessive politeness? Whatever he is, he's not, he's not a stereotype. Bugs is a very fully dimensionally, fully realized character. And he's a, a person of considerable complexity. Why is he so polite? There's a sense in which, isn't there, that this, this guy has somehow has assimilated the sort of domestic role of a black servant. He calls him Mr. Adams. His language is very formal. He, he's like a butler. He cooks. And he plays this game real well. He manages to get the upper hand in this relationship and with Nick, and even comes to Nick's aid when he sees that 
that Nick doesn't know how to deal with him. With it, with his. So anyway, the, the, anybody have any, anything to say about the use of the N-word or about the presence of this particular black man? Let me take your knife, Nick, he said. That's, that's Ad. No, you don't, the Negro said. Hang on to your knife, Mr. Adams. The prize fighter sat back. He knows Bugs, re and he knows uh, Ad really well. Also, of the many sinister smiles in this story, there is, there is um, um, you know, he met him in jail. Clearly, Bugs has a criminal record. And there was this moment in the story where Nick asks Bugs about what, what he was in jail for, and he says, I, I, I was in jail for cutting a man. And then he smiled. So this is one of the many sinister smiles in The Battler. There is hints there of a bug's capable capability for aggression as well. Also, I thought I'd mention this, there are several critics who see this as a homosexual relationship. They see bugs as someone who's, who's an opportunist, who realizes this, this individual cannot care for himself and he, of course, he says it, you know, I, you know his, his sister sends him money. I can see the company, country without com having to commit larceny to do it, as if that was the only way you could see the country. So uh, Bugs has a criminal's mindset. So you wonder about this relationship. This is not, there's not anything wholesome about this. This guy has sound, found some way to get Ed's money from his sister. When he first shows up, he hops over in the embankment with some food. He actually, the, you know, that's a pretty nice uh, campfire dinner. Nick likes it. He's very appreciative of Bugs' cooking skills. Anyway, I don't know how you feel about the, the charge of homosexuality. It does show up three or four times. The suggestion here, also, the, 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 uh, what stands out to me is the blackjack that he has, the whalebone blackjack. And, and, um, and uh, Bug says, well, they don't make them like that anymore, like he's a connoisseur of blackjacks. Also, he has one that's worn. He's had this blackjack for a long time. And, and Nick lifts it and feels it, the heft, the wearer of it. You, you, you get the idea, this is not the first person he's blackjacked. So in his own way, you know, his uh, connection to Ad is not that much unlike Nick's connection to Ad. He too is a battler of a sort against the social order and the legal order as well. He is probably extorting or he's certainly taking the money, or gets at the very least access to the money that Ad's uh, sister sends him. So, what do we think of this happy couple? This, this sort of dark version of Huck and Jim. It's at the very least, uh, and Nick is, um, there's, I just get to, I've got 10 minutes left. The, at the very end, these endings, uh, these early stories are really compelling. Remember that in last week in Indian camp, you know, there's the, the business of Nick and, and Dr. Adams in the canoe, and uh, Nick sees a bass jump who makes a circle. It, it's dawn, the new light is emerging. There's no new light in this story. There's no, there's no dawn here. The only light is sort of the purgatorial light of a campfire. Um, but there is uh, something that indicates that in the last paragraph that Nick is taken aback. And it's, it's a classic Hemingway uh, a, 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 a way to end this story. Nick climbed the embankment. This is after, of course, Bugs tells him to skedaddle for his own health. And there's that one line when Nick asks him, well, after he knocked him unconscious, well, you heard him yourself. Yeah, but I know how to do it. Oh, really? So he's, to he's told Nick to get out of town. Nick climbed the embankment and started up the track. He found he had a ham sandwich in his hand, 
and put it in his, in his, put it in his pocket. Looking back from the mounting grade b before the track curved into the hills, he could see the firelight in the clearing. Is there anything in that sentence that indicates something about Nick's state of bewilderment or astonishment or some kind of like inner, inner trying to come to terms with this? Any ideas? This is one of my favorite objective correlatives. Nick found he had a ham sandwich in his hand. You know, he got this sandwich and he's carrying it and he didn't realize it until he found he had it in his hand. His mind was elsewhere. He's already starting to process this, this experience. This has been what we call a bad day. You get punched, you get a black eye, you get knocked off a train. Now that's pretty dangerous, getting knocked off a train. You could get serious inju injury falling off or being thrown from a moving train. Just like you get a serious injury in, in, the, in the ring and he meets this <laughs> charming couple and he almost gets in another fight. So, I, I think this, this, this is particularly interesting. I'm always struck at, the, at the, how specific Hemingway locates everybody. You're, you're, you're plunged into a specific factual environment. You always know precisely in almost you know, geometric terms where the objects are, what the objects are in relation to each other. He talks about the train, how it's visible as it goes around the corners. This is very precise language. It's very interesting how, and he did the same thing in Indian camp. But anyway, I, was, uh, I wanted to point that out. You get the idea here that Nick is going to make it to Mancelona. Maybe he, but he's, he's had a meal for at least Bugs has fed him. I wanted to go back to one other thing, and I wanted to talk in my remaining minutes. I've got seven minutes. I'm going to use about three of them talking about this, and I want to open this up for some questions from you. I don't want to, to hog the whole thing myself. But there's this whole business about twinhood, and, and uh, Nick asked Bugs, well, what made him crazy? Well, too many beatings, yeah, that, but that just made him simple. The whole business about Nick uh, or Bug, ad, excuse me, uh, Ad Francis, uh, a so-called scandal about him and his sister, and this is an odd thing. In this book, Hemingway by Kenneth Lynn, this is a biography that I recommend. The thesis of this is the defining moments in Hemingway's life was when Hemingway as a child was rendered as a twin by his mother. That is to say, his older sister, uh, Hemingway was the second of six children. Uh, his older sister, Marceline, was a, was a girl and his mother raised the two alternately as boys and girls. And there are as photographs, each child had their, their, their masculine gear and their feminine gear. And then they, and, and Mrs. Hemingway would cut their hair the same. And there's that famous, that, here's the picture that, that, that Kenneth Lynn reproduces, where a family photograph in which both uh, Marceline and Hemingway had what was called the Dutch Dolly haircut. So for, for the rest of his life, Hemingway had a hair fetish. The women's hair was a powerful thing. And here's, here's the thing, this is a photo of, of Ernest and Marceline. It's a tiny thing and you probably can't see it. It's called Summer Girls. And it's Ernest and, and Marceline dressed up in women's clothing. And Hemingway, as we all know, had, uh, had androgynous fantasies. Twinhood and the state of being forcibly twinned is something that, that Kenneth Lynn talks about at length. And this is one of the stories that he talks about a lot. In The Killers, which is a, another a famous short story that I almost chose for the series, the two gangsters the narrator, the narrator tells us they looked like twins. So the fact, uh, Hemingway very much resented that this androgyny was imposed on him by his mother. It distorted his sexuality. As a young man, he saw himself as different, if not, if not actually perverted. This is an, a painful issue in his upbringing. And if irony of ironies, it's one of the things in our era which keeps him relevant. It's his androgyny, it's his identifying with women in, in a direct sexual way that's part of his current appeal. He, he's got to be laughing somewhere. His deep, deep, dark secret, the thing he wanted to keep out of, wanted no one to know, was one of the things that, that was instrumental in his current appeal 
So the twinhood aspect, and Bug says it twice. Repetition in the story, as in all of Hemingway, is very important. So that's an aspect to this story that, that I just wanted to mention. This had nothing to do with his real life model, but it has everything to do with Hemingway. And that's twinhood also has that ghost effect. It, it, there's all kinds of sinister implications to this. And that is what made Ad, uh, Ad crazy. And we suspect that it was equally destabilizing to the creator of the story. So anyway, with that, we've got just a, a few minutes to left. I thought I'd, in, in our remaining time, I, I would open this up for discussion. Does anybody have any questions or comments? What do you think of my interpretation of the story? Hope I, I hope I did a good job. It's my job to present an interpretation, not that, that it's the only one for sure. Yes, Julie. Oh, good. It's a great story. <laughs> well, he, that's funny. Ham sandwiches show up a lot. Are we, are we? No, repeat the comment. I will. She was saying that she was going to read the story, and, uh, and, then, and then Joan asked about the ham sandwich. The ham sandwich, yeah. Hemingway, actually, ham sandwiches show up in The Killers. That's an interesting thing. I don't know if that's significant or not. But, you know, that's one of the things about Hemingway, that all this stuff becomes sort of significant, and you wonder about these details, the way they reappear from story to story. But anyway, this, is story, this story is controversial for its use of the N-word. And lots of people take issue with this depiction of a black man. And I, and I respond saying, this is a very interesting and complicated black man. He's no cipher. He's no stereotype. So, I mean, and he, so this is, this is uh, you know, someone who carefully observed black people. But Hemingway gets in lots of trouble later on for his use of the N-word. So, yes, Jim? I'd try, but I'd probably get fired. Who knows what would happen to me? She asked if I, uh, if, if I was teaching this story today, what would I, how would I uh, deal with it in the classroom? I don't know. If one parent complained, I might be out of a job. You know, that's the environment we live in. But we can't teach Huck Huckleberry Finn anymore. It's just not worth the political turmoil. You know, I mean, you can, a lot of what happens in Huckleberry Finn is Mark Twain is using Jim and his plight to, to d depict the fate and the terrible ordeals that black people had, uh, the problems they had in the 19th century. But that doesn't make any difference. It's, it's the, ver the, the use of the N-word itself which renders that book censored. So to answer your question, I probably would go to another story. It all depends on how much I wanted to keep my job. Yeah, what, you know, what my other prospects for employment were. Okay. Well, anyway, I think we would see it's, I've got one minute left. I just thought I, in my remaining minute I'd say a little bit about next week's uh, concluding story. We've seen that in the first two stories that the world that, he, that Nick encounters as a child and the world that he encounters, encounters as an adolescent is very troubled. I remember when I was first encountering Hemingway in grad school in the 70s, there was a, a theologian who had a great term, a phrase. He said, Hemingway, of course he wanted to convert Hemingway. There's all kinds of religious people that, that saw uh, Hemingway. They wanted him in, in, in their fold. He said, Hemingway lived beneath the line of despair. And I've always liked that. I thought that, that there's a lot of truth in that statement. We see Indian camp was not a good place the, the, the camp on the way to, to, to Barcelona was not a good place, but the natural world as we see it in the big two-hearted river is a good place. And this is the aspect in which Indian spirituality and the, in, the native people's reverence for the natural world helps inform Nick Adams' sense of, of shelter and contentment in the natural world. The natural world is the last good place. So, that, that concludes it. Thank you for showing up. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. And thank the fine folks at the Idaho Humanities Council.